Hi, this is Kenny Albert. You're listening to the Broadway Hat Podcast with your host, Kyle Hall, the number one podcast for all things Rangers hockey. Welcome back to the Broadway Hat Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Hall. It was a weird week for the New York Rangers. They start the week off with a dominating win against the Blue Jackets at home. Obviously, a team that the Rangers should dominate. They did dominate. Uh, all in all, a good win there. But then, two efforts against New Jersey and Buffalo where the Rangers were kind of... I mean, they're coming into that game. They're riding a four-game winning streak where they had wins in seven of the last eight games. They're rolling. And they go to New Jersey with a chance to tie the Devils for second place. Actually, they would have, they would have gone above them for second place for, via the tiebreaker. They would have grabbed home ice for the playoffs and really just were flat the entire game. They had you know, a little bit of a, a third period. They showed a little more effort and had a little more energy, but um, just a tough game. I, I know it's a road game, but that's a series that right now, I mean, looking at how this season series played out, New Jersey's speed is going to be an issue for the Rangers, and it's been an issue for them all year long. And right now the, rain, the Devils almost fell back into a – uh, 1995 Devils style of shutdown defense. They went up two goals early. They shut it down, locked it down, and the Rangers really couldn't do much for the rest of the game before the third period came around. They finally scored a goal. Tarasenko had a chance there uh, with almost a minute left in the game to win it, and, it, and a great play by Ryan Gray, his former New York Ranger prospect, uh, to keep the uh, the tying goal out of the net there. So they didn't get the win in New Jersey. The Devils set three points ahead of them right now. The Rangers would have to get four points to pass them because New Jersey does have the tiebreaker over them. So right now, I I, I don't think uh, the Devils are going to catch Carolina out there a couple points behind them with a game in hand. We're heading towards a, a Rangers-Devils playoff right now in the Hudson River rivalry. It's it's awesome. It is – I know the Islanders and whatever, the Islander-Ranger rivalry is great, but the Ranger-Devil rivalry is fantastic. You go back to the 90s. It was just always such a good rivalry. And the Islanders haven't been good for, for a very long time. So people of my generation, 30-year-olds, they don't see the Islanders as the true big rival. I see the Devils as the true big rival for the Rangers. So, you know, go back to Mike Rupp punching Brodeur. Avery swinging a stick and doing the crazy stuff in front of Brodeur. Um, you know, the Eastern Conference Finals that they, the, unfortunately, Rangers lost with Henrique against Lundqvist. All great moments, all great big moments in this rivalry. Back to Matt Toe in my childhood. You know, those matchups that always happen in the playoffs. So this could be awesome. This could be a great playoff series. Hopefully it happens. I, I Personally, I think I'd rather play Carolina maybe than the than New Jersey just based off of how they match up this year against them. But um, I think yeah, for a hockey fan, though, Rangers-Devils is going to be an awesome series. So... Uh, that's where it looks like they're trending this way. We have five games left in the season right now. Uh, the Rangers have a couple. Uh, they have a national TV game Wednesday night against Tampa at home, and they hit the road for St. Louis, which is an eight o'clock start. Uh, don't you know? Don't want to miss that eight o'clock. You're sitting there at seven o'clock and it's not on TV. It's at eight o'clock because it's in St. Louis, and then they come back and they play Columbus on Saturday, and then Buffalo at home, and then wrap the season up at home against Toronto. So uh, a but. I mean, five games, but, you know, short amount of time here. And hopefully, I believe I saw the playoffs are going to start either the 17th or 18th. So the Rangers will get a couple days off before the playoffs start. And the nice thing about playing New Jersey, too, is the travel. The Rangers won't have to worry about, you know, crazy travel going back and forth. So that's a positive for that series. I honestly don't think there's a home ice advantage in that series. I You look at how the game was. I mean, historically, Ranger fans packed that building because the Devils haven't been good, and Ranger fans buy tickets. But the Devils are good this year, and especially this game, which was one of the biggest games, hottest ticket probably in Prudential Center history, almost other than the Stanley Cup game, in a very long time. And you look at the fan, it was probably 50-50 in the crowd between Rangers and Flyers. Talked to a few people that went. They said that you now there was an equal amount of let's go Devils, let's go Rangers. So... I don't think there's a huge home ice advantage. I think no matter what you want home ice, I think the Garden is more a home ice advantage than Prudential Center personally. So I think that could have been in favor of the Rangers if they did get that. But I think all in all, you know, for Ranger fans, it's great. Maybe you get a little bit cheaper playoff ticket going to New Jersey. And that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be great. Playoffs are here. 
It's the most stressful time of the year for any hockey fan. You lose years off your life in playoff hockey, going to overtime and everything else. Uh, but also some Rangers have some stats and they're chasing right now. You have Igor Shesterkin, who people can say is having a down year, which is crazy when the guy is 35 and thir- sorry, 35, 13 and 7 on the year. And uh, last year he went 36 and 13 and 4. So pretty similar record to last year. Yeah, his goals allowed are up, you know, almost 0.5, and his save percentage is down almost 20%, but he's been fantastic as of late. At one smart rolled around, he's been great. So Igor, if he gets two more wins, he'll pass last year's 36 wins and set himself a new uh, season high for his career, his young career. Obviously not too many seasons there to, uh, to go off of, but it'd be pretty cool to see him catch last year's number. Uh, also, Artemi Panarin is sitting at 87 points following his three-point uh, performance against Washington, which was a great game for the Rangers. We didn't really get into that. Great game against Washington. The Lafreniere goal was insane. It was sick. The Rangers just played a very – I know Gallant chewed them out after the loss against Buffalo, which was, you know, again, they slept walk similar to New Jersey. They slept walk and finally turned it on, and they lost in overtime there. But the Rangers had to come out swinging against Washington. They did. A 1 o'clock start. They could have lollygagged that too, but they came out firing. The Lafreniere goal, again, was just an unbelievable goal. Um, but yeah, so Panarin had three points, three points in the game. He now has 87. Uh, so he, I mean, he's got a chance now, obviously five games left to get three points to hit 90 points again. And it'll be in his four years of the Rangers. Obviously one were shortened because of COVID and his three full seasons, he'll hit 90 points. He had 95 his first year, 96 last year. So. I mean, again, it, it hard, I can go back to this all the time, but our Terry Panarin is turning out to be the greatest free agent signing in New York Rangers history. And if he can somehow bring a Stanley Cup to New York, he will be among the greats of the Rangers based off of how long his contract will be and the production he's putting up. And another guy who's going to be a great Ranger or one of the great, great Rangers of all time is Chris Kreider, just tied for the fifth most goals of, in Rangers history with 262. So his next one, he'll go into sole position of fifth place. And looking at his numbers, I mean, he's going to pass Bathgate next year at 272. And then he'll probably pass Adam Graves as well at 280. And he'll be close to 300 career goals with the Rangers after next season. So um, he, he'll be top three after next year in Rangers history and goals, which is crazy to think about. He's got years left there. He has a serious shot at catching Jill Bears. Uh, Roger Bear's 406. He's got a very good shot at catching that. And then it comes down to, do you retire his number? Do you retire Chris Kreider's number? It's going to be a very interesting debate as you as the Rangers go on further. All those guys on top of that list have the number retired. So um, They all didn't win cups. All those 70, and the guys that played in the 70s and stuff, they didn't win cups. So Graves won a cup. He's up in the rafters. Uh, if the Rangers somehow won a cup of Chris Kreider, I got to think he is... Most likely the next guy up there. There's some guys who I think deserve it. I think Ron Greshner deserves to be up there. Um, I think Emil Francis deserves to have some type of a banner up there. So there's some guys in the past. I think Brad Park deserves to be up there. There's some definitely some guys in the past who I think should be up there. But of the I mean, most recent guys after Lundquist, I think... Right now, Kreider has the best shot. You could say maybe Adam Fox in the future, maybe Artemi Panera in the future. But those guys are a little bit younger than Chris Kreider. And I just think Kreider has the track record with the Rangers. He's now 12, 13 years into his career now in New York. So, I mean, I think he has the next best shot. And that's a question I get asked a lot by people. Who do I think the next Ranger number to be retired would be? And I, I think that answer right now is probably Chris Kreider is the easiest answer. If you ask my three-year-old, it's definitely Chris Kreider his favorite player. And every time he sees number 20 in the ice, I get yelled Chris Kreider at me. So uh, I know who his favorite player is, and uh, I know he'll be very happy the day that he sees him possibly go up in the Raptors. Another guy reaching a mile, so Mika Zibanej, and obviously another Mika March, incredible month. He's got 39 goals in the year, so he is closing in on his career high of 41 and hitting 40 goals for the second time in his career. And uh, you look back, talk about, Greatest free agent pickup in Panarin. I mean, the Mika Zibanejad trade will go down as one of the greatest ones in Rangers history as well. So, I mean, a lot of these guys come together. This is why this team's good. This is why this team's great. So, five games left in the year. Gerard Gallant chugging along. 
I think he's the, you know, obviously back to back hundred point seasons. The uh he's right now has the mo is the most best winning percentage in Rangers history for a head coach. I think a guy who some people thought after the first couple of months of the season could be on the hot seat, and I think now he's shown people that he is one of the best coaches in hockey and should not be going anywhere for at least a few seasons here if he can continue this and um the, the Rangers winning having 100 points in consecutive seasons hasn't happened a lot. They did it three years in a row from 2014 to 16-17. Before that, you got to go back to the early 70s with the gag line. So this is not something that happens a lot. This is a you know a milestone for the franchise, and now they just have to try to build off last year's postseason run and, and go even further this year. So We have a great guest for you this week. We're joined by former New York Ranger Harry York, he tells some amazing stories. He had, he played with some unbelievable legendary coaches, Mike Keenan, Joe Quinville, um, Mark Crawford. I mean, some great coaches, John Muckler, who he's not a big fan of. Uh, but, you know, all these great coaches. He also had some unbelievable teammates. And Wayne Gretzky, Mark Messier, obviously Brian Leach with the Rangers, Mike Richter with the Rangers, Adam Graves with the Rangers, uh, Brett Hull with the Blues, you know, play with Yager with the Penguins. So, he tells some great stories from his time, you know, from his career. Uh, but before we send to our interview with Harry, we got a brand new sponsor this week. We have two sponsor reads this week. We have brand new, uh, brand new sponsor. Exciting news! Our new sponsor of this show, uh, Caldera Labs. Say goodbye to the generic face wash on your counter because Caldera Lab is here to save the day when it comes to your skin. Backed by a leading clinical trial where nine out of ten men experience healthier and visible improved skin. Caldera Lab has the tools to unlock your best first impression and confidence. Today, we have an exclusive offer for you, our audience, so you can try it for yourself Why and you can see why so many men trust Caldera Lab with their skincare needs. Use our code BROADWAY at calderalab.com for 20% off your, their best product. Listen, as I'm getting older, in my 30s now, you got to take care of your skin. And these guys are out there helping you take care of your skin. They're helping you with your wrinkles. They're keeping your age. Your, they're keeping you young. They're keeping you young. They keep you look good. Kadura Labs creates a high-performance men's skincare product by combining uh, pharmaceutical-grade science along with uh, na- uh, nature's purest and most potent ingredients. Kicking off their stellar skincare selection, we have the Regimen Bundle, a twice-a-day routine to transform your skin. Inside this bundle, you'll find the clean slate, the base layer, and the good. The clean slate is where you start your day. It's balancing cleanser. That uses gentle plant-based cleansing, uh, leaving all skin types exceptionally refreshed. The base layer is a nutrient-dense, fortifying moisture that hydrates your skin and absorbs fa- uh, absorbs fast, leaving with a matte finish so you can start your day confidently. And the good is your go-to at night before bed. It's clinically proven multifunctional serum that helps your helps your skin look tighter and smoother, as well as help re- helps reduce visibility of wrinkles and fine lines. How can you not beat that? As you age, you might notice more fine lines and wrinkles. It's a sign of aging, unfortunately. This is the opposite of what any guy wants, really what anyone wants. And the more you neglect your skin, the more visible this will become over time. It's time to control your skin and take these easy steps. Ready to take your skin to the next level with Caldera Lab? Look no further than the Icon. The, red, the rejuvenating eye serum is here to help address the, the three most common skin concerns around the eye. Fine lines, dark circles, and puffiness. The three worst things you can have. Committed to transparency, sustainability, and excellence, Kadura Lab is on the mission to better skin, better men's skincare around the world, priding itself on clean ingredients and doing right by its customers and planet we live in. Kadura Lab is a certified B Corporation as well as a member of the 1% for the planet. Through uncompromised craftsmanship, ex, uh, exceptional ingredients, and rigorous transparency, Caldera Lab is here to upgrade your skin and confidence. So make sure to get 20% off today by using our code BROADWAY at CalderaLab.com. That's 20% off at CalderaLab.com by using the code BROADWAY. And we're also joined by our friends over at Kunzuri. Fellas, have you ever wished you were a little bit taller? Maybe you matched on Tinder and her profile said must be six feet tall. Maybe your date wears heels and you just can't because you're just not or she just can't because you're just not tall enough. Well, Short Kings today's sponsor has you covered. Kinzori makes shoes that make you up to 2.8 inches taller without anyone noticing. Look, girls get heels, makeup, and push up bras. Why can't men get a boost in confidence as well? We're all the same height laying down if you get what I mean. 
For a limited time offer, our listeners can get up to 15% off every order with your code BROADWAY at Kanzuri.com. The site is already 30% off, so with our code, you save an extra 15% off. That's 45% off your entire order. You're basically getting these shoes for free. So make sure you go show the support to the show and go check out Kanzuri.com. That's C-O-N-Z-U-R-I.com and use the code BROADWAY. Listen, if you can get a little extra edge in the dating game, I'm out of it way now. I don't even want to think about getting into a dating game ever again. Uh, but listen, if you're in there, you're looking for uh, you make a good impression, uh, or maybe you're taking a, a picture with some of your guys at home. Listen, I got my, all my friends at home are over six feet tall, so uh, maybe the next group shot, I have to get these shoes on to make sure that I can fit in a little bit. They don't have to uh, <laughs> adjust the lens at all. But make sure you go on there, check them out. Not only does Conservative Shoes make you up to 2.8 inches taller, but they're also incredibly stylish and comfortable. These are not all man shoes. They're not Velcro shoes. They're not ugly, ugly shoes. You'll get compliments in them. Even if they don't even make you taller, you get compliments no matter what. They have styles for every occasion, smart, casual, sporty, you name it, they got it. The height insoles are actually built into the shoe, so no one can tell that you're hiding some secret height boost in there. The brand is also hidden on the shoes and the packaging, so it's literally the ultimate height hack. Life short, you don't have to be. It's time to level up the playing field, my guys. Maybe update that baiting profile to six feet. Kanzori is an absolute game changer for you and your dating life and your ring life in general. So make sure you go on the website, use our discount code Broadway, save that 15% off. You get the 45% off total. Like I said, it's basically free. So make sure you go check it out. Kanzori.com, C O N Z U R Z U R I dot com, and make sure you use that code Broadway today. We're now joined by a very special guest, former New York Ranger, Harry York. Thanks so much for joining us. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me. So I got to go way back. This is going to now go way back in your brain. <laughs> Growing up in Alberta, who was your favorite team, favorite player to watch? Oh, that's the Gretzky and the Oilers. Come on. <laughs> you never know. I don't you see, know. See now. You know what's funny is I, I didn't even play for the Oilers, and I still cheer for them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, Strangely enough, I feel like I've had a couple of guys that's grown up in Alberta that were Islander fans. Funny enough, for those rivalries back in the day. Yeah, Islanders and Flames fans. If you weren't an Oilers fan, that was the kind of guy. Those are the teams you cheered for. My dad was a Flames fan. He cheered for the Flames. I when they beat the Oilers, I'd go home, go with bed crying, right? And he thought that was funny. So <laughs> <laughs> those other teams were unbelievable, and uh, you got to play. We'll get to a couple of guys you got to play with in those teams later on. But uh, I got to talk about your junior career, the AJHL. Um, outstanding career there. Uh, you won an MVP there, 200 point seasons. Uh, but no NHL teams were coming knocking. What, what, what happened there? You know, I I don't know what happened. Honestly, like you know, I, when I signed my first contract, um, uh, Jimmy Roberts called me into the office, and uh, I was in Worcester at the time, and Jimmy Roberts was a the coach there, and he's like, uh, "Can I ask you a question?" I'm like, "What's that?" And he goes, "Do you do drugs?" I'm like, "No." Do you are you an alcoholic? No, then why aren't you playing in the NHL? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, Well, you're six foot two, 230 pounds, you skate, you score, you can do everything, but why aren't you in the NHL? There's got to be a reason. And I don't know, I was kind of a late bloomer, I guess. You know, and that's one thing that's so bad about hockey. We have scouts that watch 13 year old kids and they're gonna say, Yeah, that kid's the guy. And you know what? Those kids, those 13 year old kids carry that with them now. Till they're 20 years old like you know some of these guys that are getting drafted in the first round they scored 18 goals in junior hockey well that makes no sense how was that kid drafted first round but but maybe it's something he did down the road which is you know i don't know maybe it's that money ball mentality oh he's got a good looking girlfriend or something i don't know but the kind crazy, of kind but... of retard i mean he's been the chosen one for the last uh five six years now i feel like he, he was like 11 years old in the driveway we saw videos of him yeah exactly like so I'm not sure. I, I I think like when there's someone like that, yeah, they're obviously they, they are skilled and played. Like you know, when you watch my team Canada, yeah, like he's amazing hockey player. So they obviously did some right things, right? But they're just some like watching my son. My son's coming up through the ranks, and he's 16 years old, and just some of the kids that he's played against. Man, they've given every opportunity, but they've been touted as that kid too up the opportunity. And, you know, being from coming from where I came from. I know that everything's not roses. Like you, you have to face some adversity coming up that ranks. Like I always tell people, like first year AAA midget, which would be U eighteen. I, I don't know how many points I got. 
But the next year I came back, I kind of started piecing it together. And the following year, I won the most valuable player of junior, Alberta Junior Hockey League. It just happened like, you know, a two year span for me. And all of a sudden I was, I became a, a good hockey player, you know? So I played D my whole life right up until like midget hockey. And then some guy said, well, I think we should play him at forward. So, <laughs> so that worked out for me, but you know what I had, uh, um, after my one junior year, uh, Grant Stanbrook from uh, Maine wanted to give me a full ride. And honestly, I did not want to go to school. You know, I, I regret that now, but it worked out for me. Like the following year I was playing in the NHL, but you know, when I hear of all the stories of people talk about when they were at school at some of these hockey schools and they say it's the best time of their life. And I think, um, Maine went on to win a national championship. So and that was the whole Korea play. era, right? I think that they were a powerhouse then. Yeah. They, and you know, they were, I guess they're all recruiting violations. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It was like Texas basketball, uh, football in the day, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Here's a scholarship and a car and 10 grand. Yeah. 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 Everyone, <laughs> you get a scholarship. Everyone in the family gets one too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you end up signing the the East Coast League, and obviously you worked your way up from there. But you were in Nashville. That's before hockey was a thing in Nashville. How crazy yeah. to see the scene there now compared to when you were there. You know, we we were we were a good team. We had a great team. Mark Kumpel was our coach that year. We had some amazing hockey players. We had Glenn Metropolitan. Me and Glenn Metropolitan actually lived in the same little town complex um, out in. I want to say it was Chattanooga Nuga or something like that. And it's about 15 minutes out of Nashville. And Glenn went on to play, I think, 500 games mm-hmm. in the NHL, right? Yeah. So it's pretty crazy to see an East Coast team have two NHLers. And, you know, but again, everyone's world is so different. I always tell people, you know, just because you're not a hockey player, you, you grow up and maybe be something else. We had a guy on that team. His name was Hugo Belanger. He was actually in that Danbury Thrasher movie or whatever the hell. He was he was on uh, the front cover or something like that. But anyways, his big claim to fame is like he's like some art. I don't know what's that where you sell cosmetics. <laughs> he um, go he yeah I yeah know what he you mean go, yeah I got you yeah yeah he goes to stadiums like in a bedazzled suit and it's like thirty thousand people and he he's like the president of it like it's crazy dude you know so it's it's just so funny like everyone in Canada obviously longs to be a hockey player and you know it's the dream of everyone and you know but and let's it's it's uh it's a hard life people don't understand how hard of a life it is and and how hard it is to get there and luck like luck you need so much luck like it's crazy well the blues found you and they they signed your contract and lucky you you get to go and uh, go to the blues camp and see mike keenan and try to make the team as a rookie so uh let's hear some good keenan stories so the, there's a story behind that. So after um, uh, it, after um, Jimmy Roberts called me in the office, he said, hey, I think I can get you signed. And I'm like, oh, really? And he's like, I think I can get you Philadelphia or St. Louis wants you. And uh, he ended up doing a two-year deal. For, I want to say I got like 825000 in two years. Like coming from like tier two hockey in Alberta, I thought that was amazing. And I just had to buy him a box of stogies. Good deal. So I buy buy this box of stogies. I'm in Worcester. I'm ready to go home. I've been on the road for two years playing hockey between, you know, junior hockey, professional rural hockey, East Coast League, the IHL and the American League. And now I'm going home. And the phone rings and it's Mike Keenan. And he wants me to come practice with them. And that was when um, Nick Kiprios took out Grand Fears' knee. So the uh, Blues are playing Detroit in the next round. And that's when that Steve Eisman made, scored that famous goal. So I was up there then practicing with them. And, you know, some of the veterans would come out and say, hey, like Mike really likes you. Like, do you have an agent? And I never, I didn't tell anyone that I was already signed. And uh, played along with it. And But I knew he liked me. And um, so the following year, I went in. Jeremy Roberts was assistant coach now <laughs> and Mike, I knew Mike was there and Mike, I knew Mike liked me right from the get go. And, um, you know, it was one of those things where that I respected Mike cause Mike would bench anyone. Like if you weren't playing well, he was going to bench you. 
But if you were playing well, it didn't matter how much you made or, you know, or what you did last year or the year before, he was going to play you. And I, and I like that. And he, and he played, played as well, played as a lot, but there's always lots of funny stories when it comes to Mike either. <laughs> <laughs> we've heard quite a few of them, but the, the blues days we've heard, uh, I think Greg Gilbert told a funny one where he kicked, uh, kicked the water bucket at one of the practices and broke his foot. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I yeah. yeah. So there's always good ones with Keenan, but uh, Brett Hull, obviously legend, yeah. hockey legend on the team. Him and Keenan were also, you know, the best of friends as well. As well. Uh, any good blow up stories between those two? Oh, you know, not a lot between actually, not a lot. Oh, not a lot between those. I was more Joel and Brett. Like, Joel oh, yeah, and Brett, yeah, didn't like each other. Mike was, you know, like, I think Mike and they both knew where they stood with each other. And I think they did both knew not to cross those lines where, where Joel was, I'm the coach, you're the player. It doesn't matter who, what player you are. And, you know, that's got to be tough. Like, you know, I'm going to tell you one story and I don't know if I'm going to get anyone in trouble, but whatever. And uh, Joel had sat me for a hockey night in Canada game and we we're in Toronto. And, uh, I'm, I do the morning skate and um, we're all getting back on the bus and Al McInnes comes to me on the bus and he says, you're playing tonight. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, Joel told me I'm not playing. And he's like, no, you're playing tonight. He goes, I went in there and I told him Harry's playing tonight. And I'm like, what? He's <laughs> Al McInnes. I remember him looking at me saying that he had a thousand games and the coach only had like, 340 games or whatever right and he knew what he was talking about so you're playing tonight and I always think of that you know and I kind of hold my head high and I had a lot of these veteran guys that really liked me and Joel might have not liked me but these guys had my back but the net we won that game 2-1 Al McKinnis scored a, a kind of a flub shot from the red line tickled by Al Felix Potvin and the next day Joel just not happy about it <laughs> was not happy about someone you know and that's 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 you know you think of the dynamics of a nhl dressing room how many egos and like now you're including a coach and you know like you know so when you see these teams that you win and everyone's on board with it like it's it's amazing how that happens right <laughs> Well, the crazy thing is that so Keenan's there, he gets fired, and obviously Keenan's personality is Keenan. You know, Mike Keenan's personality is he's he's a, this aura of a coach, and then you bring in Quinville, who obviously had his own thoughts and strong thoughts and opinions. So, how crazy was that from a player standpoint, going from one personality to another personality that was so strong? Well, uh, when I think when Joel got there, Joel um, Joel originally liked me, um, but Joel was also uh, we had. Um, Oh, what was his name? Not the best with names anymore, but he was a he was a Keenan guy, and he was a coach, and he was a he was the first guy to do the computer and and systems kind of. I want to say his last name is Howard, but it's not. It'll come to me, but he he stayed on with Joel, and it became a really systematic team. Whereas before, like when Mike had it, it was like we were all kind of you're supposed to know what you're gonna do, and you're gonna battle. You know, in practice, like they help you a little bit with systems, but you know, at, at the end of the day, you were supposed to know systems. And Joel was the guy that really broke it down, like stick on puck, you know, obviously stick in lanes, and you know, really broke that down. And uh, and I and obviously, I think I, I must not have been the most defensive forward for him, and and that's what he was really looking for. So yeah, it was one of those things I kind of found fell out of favor in him and you know like I had put some numbers up with Joel too so at that time I was playing online with Joe Murphy and uh we were doing well like I thought we did well together me Joe Murphy Scotty Peller and and then um they brought Craig Conroy in and everyone knows what happened to Craig Conroy Craig Conroy's mm -hmm. career took off there right under Joel and Joel liked him and he was a little better defensively than I was and yeah that's kind of what happened with that but you again go ahead no, go, go, keep going. Again, the, the difference dynamics between coaches, um, as a player, from my perspective, you have a very black and white relationship with the coach. You kind of try to find out what he expects of you, and you try to do that well, and that's all you can do, really. It's it's really – it's not a job where you're slapping high fives <laughs> to each other every morning, right? 
you know, well, it's yeah, it was like your rookie year that you got to a, a hot start. You had, you know, had a rookie of the month in November and you ended up I'm, with 14 goals that year. I mean, when when did you kind of settle in, like say, hey, hey, I'm an NHLer now? I don't think I ever did. You know, I always felt like I could just never get to that next step. Like I was a third or fourth line guy. The first year when they popped me in and Mike had me there, we I remember this and me and Jimmy Roberts, me and Jimmy Campbell were just flying. He had one rookie of the month the first month and I run rookie the next month. I think we had 30 points or something like 20 points in 30 games. Like we were so far ahead of everyone, like guys that are in the hall of fame, like Joe McGinley. And uh, they put Brett Hall on the other wing. And I remember Brett saying it was about time <laughs> that he got to play with us because we were just flying. Right. And, you know, I, I, it's one of those things where, you know, like I always tell people this kind of the story where that, you know, I'm, we we're playing Phoenix and I remember being so mad that they had, you know, guys that have played in the NHL like for 15, you know, had scored 50 goals on the ice over me because I, I just, I knew they weren't going to play well and I, and I was playing good and I could feel it. And I'm like, I'm going to win this game. And I was so mad at Mike for having these guys out because they didn't want to, they didn't look like they wanted to win. And uh, two years later under Joel, I was just happy to play four minutes a game making $400,000. And somewhere in that, those between those two coaches, I had lost the total drive of, of not just competing, but just being the best, right? Mm-hmm. And I think I think that's that's where hockey players again. You have all these egos in this room and dynamics, and and there's a pecking order and stuff like that. Whereas I think you have to be really mentally strong to be able to stand up for yourself and know what you're capable of. The end of your second year there with St. Louis, you get traded to the Rangers. At the, it was, I guess, it was a deadline, right? At the end, of the, right yeah. Toward the end of the year. So, that, was that a surprise to you? Did you kind of see the right on the wall there. It surprised me a little bit. You know, I think most people, when they're young, they just think that they're going to play in NHL forever, right? The, the same team and all that stuff. And I, I remember Pierre Turgeon used to tell me, "Harry, he says, whatever you do, don't buy anything big." He says, "Because you're going to get traded. Mm-hmm. Buy yourself a good bed because you're going to spend lots of time in it." And that's it. Small TV, everything else small, right? And uh, I had traded to New York, and I was generally excited being there. You know, like you know, Gretz was there, and I had I had I had known Gretz from when he was in St. Louis. Um, Mac T was there, and I knew Mac T kind of had my back, and you know, and um, you know, and and it was a chance to become, you know, um, a top cent top two centerman, and. Um, and yeah, I, I, I liked it. And I, you know, initially I remember my first game there, you know, like I saw a video of it and of the highlights and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, I, I was, again, I was so excited, but it's unfortunate what happened. Like, I think it was my second game. Um, Keith Primo hit me from the side and I separated my shoulder. And then the following year, I just, I don't know. Um, Mux didn't really like me anymore. I'm not sure why, but he just did not like me. And then I, I remember they, I remember this funny thing. They sent me to the minors and they weren't allowed to. And at that time, the Rangers minor system was um, at uh, Hartford. Mm -hmm. And they weren't allowed. My agent called and my agent was uh, JP. He used to work for the Bobby Orr firm. They weren't allowed to do that. He's like, what do you do? Where are you at? And I'm like, I'm in Hartford getting bag skated every day. He goes, you can't be there. And I'm like, well, I'm here. (laughs) (laughs) So, So I don't know, like. I've never been, honestly, like with the Rangers, I've never been so emotionally broken down and mentally like uh, abused by an organization where you just really, really felt like uh, just a complete piece of meat, you know? And, and it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't think it was an organization. I think it was just the way John Muckler was at the time. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not, I haven't quite put my why things transpired the way they are, but it wasn't a, yeah. So when I got traded to Pittsburgh, it was it was happy days. <laughs> I was gonna say, was it, was it Muckler or was it Neil Smith? Like, was it uh, who was? No, you know, who... Neil, I don't think Neil Smith. I don't think it was Neil Smith doing like you know, like I think I, I had plenty of talking talks with Neil, and I never got that impression. But I got that impression that Mux just didn't like me. Like you know, straight from I, training camp, like right out of camp, it was. Well, this is one. This is one. So we get to training camp, and he he liked me at the start. Like my first game, I played a lot, played in overtime. It was just me and Gratz playing in overtime. And 
he, you know, that was the kind of player he liked to play. He liked, you know, a physical player hitting, you know, and stuff like that. And I, and I did that the first game. That was pretty easy to do. Um, second game, I got hurt, and that was it. So the following year, I came back, and I remember we are playing in, um, I think, New Hampshire. The training camp was in New Hampshire. And it's on this Olympic ice surface. <laughs> and we have two centimeter, we have two centermen on our inner squad team, and it's me and Gretz. So you can imagine how great a shape Gretz is in. And uh he's and the shifts he's taking, he's probably taking like 20, 30 second shifts on this Olympic ice surface. And Mux is yelling at me to hit people. Like, are you effing kidding me, dude? Like, I can't, I can barely stay on the ice for like an hour, like, you know, an hour and a half game with two centermen. And I remember I got, I think I got a couple points one game and he was so mad at me. He came in, called me and he says, that's all I'm looking for. And I'm like, no, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I still to this day boggled by, by, by it. And it's unfortunate how it ended there because I really thought, I could have did something more than I did there, but I don't, I just don't think things are fighting against me there. So chasing Koval off around the ice as he skates around away from you. Like what are you, what are you supposed to do <laughs> yeah. there? Trying to hit him. Yeah. Trying to hit Colby <laughs> on the freaking with the guy. Good luck with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, any good Gret stories? Actually, um, you know, no, not, I, I have more Gretzky stories when I was in St. Louis. Cause I, I was just, in that in armored enamored with the with the guy and i never met him and it was the first time i was going to meet him and in an nhl dressing room you have this another dressing room where you take your suit clothes off and get your underwear then you come into the dressing room with all the equipment but that used to be our tv time tv room as well and we all had our own little locker and that's they had a bunch of uh chairs in the middle so i was sitting in this chair waiting to watch you know back row not you know i'm just a young guy i'm i'm just there to practice so i'm just in the back row and i just happen to be by gretzky's stall where he puts his clothes on and gretzky comes out and he's putting his dress shirt on and he puts his arm through his sleeve and punches me right in the side of the head <laughs> and i remember telling him sorry <laughs> and i'm moving my chair over and he did i remember not even saying a word but it was, I was really fortunate. Gretz, Gretz, I'm fortunate. Gretz liked me and I sat beside him in both dressing rooms. Um, yeah, like in St. Louis, I sat by him. In New York, I sat by him. In the practice in Rye, New York, I sat beside him. So, you know, I was pretty fortunate that way. Yeah. So, again, pretty tough to believe they still played with Wayne Gretzky, right? Yeah. I mean, you probably had his poster, you know his face on a poster on your house when you're a kid i have, I mean, I yeah. have his jersey dude <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you I, go. I, you know, I stepped on the ice in st louis and i remember asking peter zezel i'm like do you think i can get a wayne gretzky stick and he's like i don't know you'd have to ask him <laughs> <laughs> he's so sneak in there at the practice and just grab one off the rack and you know that's one thing honestly i never did i never asked anyone for anything you know and i always and i think that's one of the older guys mentioned that to me. He says, you always don't ever be that guy that thinks that, you know, the check's always coming in and you're always going to be there. You know, there is an old saying that if you make 500 games, you make five years, you're in for life in the NHL, but don't ever feel like you're always going to be there. Like it could happen so fast and all of a sudden you'll be out of the game. Right. So it's, it's very interesting that way. Well, your tenure at the Rangers, like you said, John Muckler runs you out of town. Yeah. You get traded with, and a big trade too, Alex Kovalov yeah. trade to back to Pittsburgh for um, Peter Nedved, which was yeah. a big deal at the time. Uh, I actually had Sean Pronger on the show as well earlier. That was in that oh, trade yeah. too, going back the other way. Uh, but your first game with Pittsburgh was against the Rangers. How fired up are you for that game? Yeah, well, at that time, I just wanted to kill someone. But <laughs> it, it just, you know, again, it I, I knew things weren't going to go well in Pittsburgh either. We do, we have our first practice and I don't know. I think it was Kevin Constantine was a coach. He calls me in and he tells me that, you know, that they've got the army Yager and they kind of let him do what he wants to do. And, you know, the rest of us, you know, we just kind of hang on and stuff like that. And then I, and I remember him coming into the dress room and he didn't see, he didn't feel like work, you know, that they were playing practicing that day and he just left. You know, and uh, I always think it's kind of funny now when you see him and how everyone says how hard he worked. Well, I think he would start working harder after just to stay in the game because when he originally was there, he I didn't think he worked that hard really. But 
we did this practice and uh this constant comes over and he's like blows a practice over and he says hey um i want you to go blue line red line blue line red blue line just, I, I don't know why he wants then he says to uh martin strack he goes i want you to race martin strack and i'm like okay so we raised me and this martin straka <laughs> and if he doesn't if i don't beat him i tie him across you know doing this thing and he called me and he goes yeah i don't know why he looks so slow though and he skates away and it's the only team i've ever been a part of that actually we had a whole week off so i drove back to new york from pittsburgh and got my stuff and drove back and when i got to the hotel um my my gear was in the lobby waiting for me <laughs> and i got up to the room and I had a message on the phone. I picked the phone up and it was Mike Keenan. So I picked you up on waivers today. That's how fast it honestly happened. Like it was crazy. Like I was in Pittsburgh. No one called me nothing. Like it was just like, you know, it just, it's crazy, dude. Like a hockey world is so crazy. Like, you know, but I, I honestly wish things would have worked out in New York. I loved playing at Madison square garden. I just thought it was such a cool environment. And I thought the, the fans just really appreciated like um, a hard nose, heavy game, like work ethic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I just remember playing that first game, remember hitting everything and anything. And, you know, and like, I have this video and I think it's John Davidson saying that, you know, the crowd was cheering Harry, Harry, you know, so it was just a cool experience. And as um, you know, it's just unfortunate things didn't work out the way they I envisioned them to work out, but yeah. No, you're right. New York fans love the lunch pail, blue collar guy that goes out yeah. there and throws, throws the hits around. I just hated living in Rye, New York, fucking driving that Manhattan <laughs> street. Like, I was like, what is this? Crazy, dude. Yeah, we've I've heard that from a couple guys. That's just yeah. the guys that live in the city. They got to do the, the reverse commute that way, and then they come back, and it's just ridiculous. You know, so well, what's just, crazy is like, I remember one day I was scratched, obviously. I think I played five games in the first 30 that following year, and uh, he scratched me, so I thought I would leave Rye around four thirty. I don't think I, got, I. I think I was an hour late for the game that started at seven thirty. Like it took like four hours to get downtown. But <laughs> when we would take the after pregame skate out in Rye, we would leave at like twelve o'clock. We would be downtown in an hour, right? No problem. So it was. It was. It's just a different dynamic, obviously, right? Like crazy coming from a town of five thousand people and yeah. all of a sudden living. New York. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you go, so you go to Vancouver. You reunite there with Keenan, which I'm sure was great for you. And you had a good year there too. You you play well in Keenan, but um, also Mark Messier is there, another obvious yeah. Oiler legend. So what was that like? Put Mess there. Well, Mess is Mess is everyone's guy, right? Like he's the, he's like a man's man, right? Like when I showed up, I think I scored five goals in five games, and. You know, I thought everything was going back to the way it was. And I think they fired Keenan there and they hired Crawford, who Crawford was the head coach when Quinville was assistant coach. But, you know, I was prepared for it more better this time. Um, but yeah, Mark was, Mark's the guy, right? Like me and Mark got along really well. Like I'd say, for some reason, I seem to have got along, I got along with the older guys a lot better. I think, it put, I think it's because I smoked. <laughs> And so we'd go out and have drinks. I'd have like two packs of smoke so that they all could bump smokes off me. But Mark never, Mark wasn't that guy, but Mark would be the guy though. Honestly, if you sat down at a bar and you said, Hey, let's drink 10 tequilas. He'd be like, yeah, let's do it. You know, like he was just that guy. Like he was just a man's man. He was up for anything. And, you know, he was, but yeah, when it was time to compete, he, there's no other guy you'd have on your team. Right. Like he would go to the ends of the earth to move mounds, you know? So the strangest thing about his time in Vancouver was Ranger fans hated it because he left New York. It seemed like Vancouver fans hated him in like they never liked them there, or and it, it I, never I, worked out. I don't. I never understood why they don't like him at all. I never quite got that either. Like, um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure what that was. What that's about, uh, you know? Like, I don't think they. I don't think they liked the whole, you know, Keenan thing and and like how Keenan was trying to mail that team a lot, like what he how he built the Rangers that year. And I don't think he could have did that. The others by that time were starting to get a little old in the tooth and stuff like that. And and I think the game was has definitely changed. Like I think right now you're seeing a big passing of the guard of of two younger kids, younger players, you know. And back in those days, I think I think the last really good old team probably would have been that 
that Ranger team, right? Mm -hmm. Like even like the Detroit teams after they had some young kids coming up, like they were always filtering young kids. Like, and who was the youngest kid on the New York Ranger team that year? It's probably Zuboff. <laughs> probably Zuboff was 23. <laughs> Yeah, he was probably yeah. the youngest guy. Him and Leach were probably the two young guys, and they had. I mean, you guys, they had so many vets on that team. Though they were, they brought in yeah. Matteo. They brought in, uh, yeah. who I think may have Matteo was with you too in San Jose. Yeah, he's been playing with Stefan you know. and yeah. Um, you know, McTavish on that team, he was probably forty years old at that time. You know, <laughs> Glenn Anderson was a grandfather, I think, uh, by the time he was on the Rangers. Yeah, there was there was some vets. <laughs> I played with team. all those guys in St. Louis. <laughs> yeah, like, totally, yeah. I, Keenan I brought them, them all. Keenan brought them I all. I watched over. them all retire in St. Louis. Brian Noonan, you know, like. You know, like I watched them all play their last games. I remember being at the last game when Detroit beat us. And I remember the the other young guys that were with us we were at the strip joint in St. In Louis. And I'm sitting at this table and it's all Calgary Flames and Oilers that I watched from my youth. There's Mac T, Al McKinnis, Glenn Anderson, you know, Grand Fear, and they're all talking about you know, what could have did different and how they could have, you know, won the game and been better. And I remember there was a team, the, uh, a bench behind me and there was all the, we called ourselves the black aces, it was Jamie Rivers, Jamie McLennan. And we were just up there to practice against. And they just couldn't believe I was sitting with all these veterans, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I maybe known for like two weeks and, you know, and, and I remember them talking. I remember Glenn Anderson that, saying that that was probably going to be it for him because he said, they're going to replace me with guys like, he pointed towards me and said, younger guys like this guy, you know, like that's the way the game's moving now, right? Sure. I played in a 45 playing... Stanley Cup rings at that table. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but it all ends for us. I was playing in an era that was dominated by massive men. Like that's kind of why the Rangers brought me in was that I was a big centerman. I was 6'2", 230. And, you know, you had guys like Robert Holik, um, Eric Lindros, like guys that were massive dudes, right? that could still skate, but that's how they, they, they made the game up. Right. So it was a short window. It was probably like the power, power forward window of like 10, 12 years, but man, there were some massive guys playing hockey at that time. I got to ask you though, uh, an ugly story from your career, the first year McSorley incident, you were there in Vancouver for that. How surreal was that? You know, I remember after like, we, I had lived, I was living across from General Motors place at the time. It's like only two blocks away from the rink. And there was this kind of this bar, real fancy barbecue kind of place underneath. Um, I had lived four floors up at this, like this kind of loft building. And we always went to this barbecue place after. And I remember he came in, Donald came in and we kind of said, Hey dude, like, I don't think this is cool for you to be in here. You know, like just because of what happened, like you shouldn't be out seen drinking, you know, when you, someone just slapped you and knocked you out dead cold. Right. So we end up getting them home and stuff like that. But, you know, there's lots of moments at hockey that have scared the, you know, crap out of me. But, um, and there's lots of, don't get me wrong. Like I, I don't think professional sports, players should have an opinion on politics and life goings on. I just think it's dumb. I think you're just asking for an open and can of worms, like with all this stuff going on in the world today. And I don't think there's a right or a wrong answer to any of this, but I remember watching that game and I remember a lot of the TV did not show what was happening between intermissions and whistles and stuff like that. And you could see Marty getting more um, agitated as the game was going on. And uh, they would have their verbal jousts, and sometimes Donald would make gestures from the bench at him, and uh, he just must have snapped or something like that, right? And but again, they don't show you that stuff; they just show you the, what happened, right? Like, so I don't know, dude. I don't know who was in the right, who was in the wrong, but <laughs> I just keep that to myself, and you know, and I don't know. Hockey is a pretty intense sport, and sometimes you got to really check in. Uh, the emotions a little bit or stuff like that happens. And then it just goes like off the wall and you're like, what just happened? You know? Yeah. No, I, it's one of those incidents that I feel like, you know, it, it pops up every once in a while too, in a highlight reel of like, you know, you won't believe this. And, uh, you know, kids nowadays don't even know what that is. Cause what 2000 that was from. So, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> it feel yeah, old, it's man. crazy. Hey, you know? It doesn't even look like you even hit him that hard. But you know, like you hit that. him right in the temple, right? He's hit him right. In the... yeah. well, I think it was more the the bounce off the ice, right? It was more the head yeah. bounce off the ice that got him. I think. 
But man, that guy is destroying people at senior hockey in Quebec. Like, <laughs> he's still like, forty. I think he's like forty eight years old. Whatever he is now, he's yeah. still and he crap still wants. To, yeah, and he still wants to chuck him. I think the Oilers need him to protect McDavid or something. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's crazy, man. Like I just you know, and I think it was. I think he was been doing it for a long time, like playing the senior hockey out in Quebec and like. So to me it's like when it was over for me it was over like there was i didn't want to i didn't want to go back i didn't want to go like i play shinny with the boys but i ain't going to go play hit hockey anymore like <laughs> a couple of alumni games were just you know two and touch out there right yeah exactly you know like well for me like when i i retired with, with post-concussive syndrome so when you're all you're insured right through lords of london and stuff like that and when you sign off you're that's it like you, you can never play a hit hockey game ever again. So for me, it was like a couple senior teams came calling. I'm like, no, dude, I'm not going to, I'm not giving my insurance money back to come play senior <laughs> hockey. <laughs> yeah. It's good. It's so about dope. illegal recruiting. I'll take a large, uh, large sum on the table, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, I don't think they can afford that. So <laughs> uh, a couple of rapid fire. Actually, I have one question for you. You played one game in Syracuse your last year. You had 15 penalty minutes in one game. What the hell happened there? Oh, okay, so um, that that's, that's how the, I, that, that jumped out that, of me. That's how I ended my hockey career. So basically, um, I had to go down. Um, it was that trade deadline, and me and the Steve Korea. Do you remember Steve Korea? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. Paul's brother, right? Yeah. So we went we went down to clear room for. I can't remember what how that, but we had to go down. And um, Stan Smeal was a coach there. We were playing in Hershey. This actually this actually made me a lot of money. Um. And uh, we went there and we play Hershey. And um, I think they were Colorado's farm team at the time. And uh, they had like, I think his name was Scott Walker. No, Scott Parker. Remember, he's a tough guy with the big anvil beard. And yeah, stuff. He sounds familiar. yeah, he sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah From yeah, Colorado. Had, okay, yeah. Yeah, they had a bunch of other guys. Who knows? I don't even remember who the hell was on the team. And we go up for warm up, and first shift comes out, and uh, I think we had a whole line of NHL. I think Chuberoff was our centerman, and we get scored on. So, and the place is going crazy. Very first shift, and we're like, "What the?" You know, like these guys are ready to play against us here. You know, like it was my I had three hundred games in NHL. You know, so the next shift we come out, and Steve gets a puck, and we're going down on this two on one, and I think they had this defenseman named Dan Smith, and. Uh, I'm yelling for the puck and I'm coming down the other side, like full tilt, like I'm 230 pounds. It's the prime of my life. And I'm flying as fast as I can come down the other side. And Steve, uh, the Dan Smith takes a puck away from Steve and does an exit and goes behind the net while I'm coming the other side, like full tilt. I don't remember this. I don't remember even feeling it. Like I just went through him like, like flower. Apparently he, I hit him so hard he fly, swings around and smashes his face off the glass and knocks himself dead cold. And that was the end of his hockey career as well. I got the puck and I came around front and I think I passed it out to Steve or I tried to, to do a wraparound. And uh, I just remember their whole team just coming at me. And uh, someone grabbed my arms. And as he's putting his hands, his arms over my head, my helmet came off. And, uh, Another guy was coming at me face on with this like cross check. And so I turned away. And as I turned away, we all went down and his stick happened to go across the back of my neck and just piled my face into the ground. And and that was the end of my hockey right there. Maybe it was knocked out for about, I don't know, five or 10 minutes. I had blood coming from my forehead, but it wasn't, it wasn't super severe. Like, it, you know, like I remember getting up and I remember the trainers gave me off the ice and, they sent me for a neurologist the next day, which was crazy. Like I couldn't believe they got me to see a neurologist the next day. And the guy just, the guys said that I'm done. He said, you're done playing hockey. And you know, what's crazy. I went two years after that, I went to Karen Johnson, Miss Dr. Brown. Like I went to all these professionals all over the world. And it all came back to that, that one guy telling me I was done. And they all did these special, these tests and everything like that. And that guy, the very first guy seen in Syracuse, I should have just got him to write a letter then because that's not what happened, right? I went on to Neurontin. I, you know, I tried to make a comeback and I just could not get by 
these headaches. And, you know, even to this day, I always think to myself, you know, that was nothing. Like I didn't have nothing, but I literally could not have a drink of beer because uh, alcohol makes your brain swell. So as soon as I'd, I'd have a drink of beer, I'd have to go lay down, really? you know, like, yeah, it got to the point where I remember when I seen Karen Johnson, she's like, honestly, Harry, walking your dog is optional. She goes, you need to just relax, you know, and that's it. So it is what it is. That's how I got to 15 minutes. They gave me five minutes for hitting this guy in a 10 minute misconduct. And yeah, but yeah. I feel like if, I feel like if you get cross checked in the head and smashed down, you know, maybe a little too much in the misconduct, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe they could have held off on that. It's a little. But, but what's crazy about it is I, so I, I've signed with Lords of London and got insurance. And so they paid me for the concussion, my NHL salary. And like seven years later, this Burke Borelli called me from New Jersey. And he, um, I want to say there's an NHL player from there. I want to see, he was a native guy. And I want to say his last name's Daniels, maybe a tough guy in New Jersey. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyways, long story short, because I was heard in Hershey, that they had to, WCB would pay me the max salary, max of being hurt and the work of $22,500 American. So it was like eight years. So they owed me like $186,000. <laughs> and this Bert Pirelli, I thought this was a scam. I'm like, yeah, if you can get it, get it, go <laughs> ahead. Yeah. And you know, like six months later, he's like, yeah, I got it. And he was like, what? He was like, hey, we, we got a gr gross buyout of $180,000. And uh, yeah, and I'm like, what? So yeah, he took his share and that's what he does, I guess. You know, like New York has like messed up like labor rules or I don't know what the hell. And so at that point, there's no questions asked, right? It's just thanks, well, yeah, thanks so much. For me, like, for me, like my first Lords of London case, like that went on for like two years. Like I honestly, to, I had to hire a lawyer just for one day of getting cross-examined so that they would pay me anything. So I I was making 440000 American at the time, which is peanuts. Like, man, if I had scored 14 goals in the NHL right now, I'd make $3 million. <laughs> like, <laughs> You know? So I'm making 440 and so I I'm I have insurance for 500 and I think they only paid me like 350. We just wanted to get it done because it was like they wanted to go to court and you know and I I I'm a firm believer that you know every day you wake up and you didn't think anything was wrong with you but at the end of the day obviously there was something wrong with me cuz I I couldn't balance anymore and you know but I don't think things are as bad as I don't know. I'm not in their shoes. I shouldn't say because I see, see lots of people with concussions and stuff like that. But I firmly believe it's it's if we have a concussion and we need to stay moving and keep our brain active instead of just thinking we're still professional athletes. I think a lot of us, when we get hurt, we want to continue with the professional athlete lifestyle, and it's it's impossible to do yeah. right. And I think you're a fit dude and you're a good looking guy and you're playing the best sport in the world and everyone looks up to you and all of a sudden you take that part of your life away, what's left, you know? And I think a lot of people feel like that's, that's all they have. And I think so depression sets in. And I think that's maybe that's my philosophy. That's why we're having such bad luck with drugs and stuff like that. But I don't know. I, I didn't wait around. I, I got on with life and, you know, became a normal person and, you know, that lifestyle doesn't mean, I don't even remember that really. Like, so <laughs> when people want to talk podcasts, I, I, I enjoy it. It's a different, you know, I play with Wayne Gretzky. Can you believe that? <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. yeah. I, and this brings me to my last question then for you. What's your favorite memory from your career? Oh man, probably the desire to be on the ice against Phoenix that game. I was so mad that Mike wouldn't put me on the ice and, um, I end up tying, I end up setting Brett Hall up with three seconds left in the game. And we went to overtime. And the first, the starting shift of overtime, uh, we got Brett Hall, Pierre Turgeon, Jeff Cornell, Shane Corson on the bench, and me and Jim Campbell are starting overtime. And uh, Brett Hall set me up to, to win the game. Like, you know, but I was just so driven to be there. And I, and I thought I deserved to be there um again like it's one of those things where that that's probably my best memory that i have you know so yeah it's good it's great i've i've seen the highlight as well the the celebration is great too afterwards <laughs> you know what's it's funny a is so uh, 
I was on Hockey Night in Canada. I remember, remember everyone remembers Don Cherry. Yeah, yeah. And back in those days, you couldn't celebrate like that. You can't celebrate that like that. And he he pulled. I actually have it on VHS. <laughs> he says I let Harry do this, you know, because he came from the East Coast League and stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah, if it was Yarmir Yarger doing that, it probably wouldn't have went well. You know. <laughs> oh man. Well, Harry, thanks but so like, much. For, oh. But no, like no. two years two years earlier, like I was playing junior hockey in Fort McMurray, Alberta, dude. Like it's yeah, it's pretty crazy, it's a surreal story. But yeah, yeah it was score, fun scoring against Mike Gartner, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Gardner and Happy Boolin. <laughs> Boolin Law. Wow. It's a brand name right there. But you know what? You know, I think the year I was in New York there and I had my, I got my, I separated my shoulder and there was a, three of us. I think we had to stay back. And I think Patty LaFontaine was one of them. And I think that was Patty LaFontaine's last year, right? Yeah. He got the concussion and that was it. And it was just really interesting to go through that as well. And then, look back and think of all the stuff he was going through at the same time. Right. So he was still I, putting up goals too. He was still playing great. Oh yeah. Like the <laughs> New York Rangers had an awesome team. Like, you know, like that year where I was there, like, I don't like you had Mike Richter and that and, you know, Leach and yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy though. When you see hockey, like sometimes I even watch hockey now and I think it's rigged. <laughs> Because, you know, you got all these teams that are just amazing, but they can't win. And then all of a sudden you got the Boston Bruins that are going to set the record for most wins. You're like, who's on their team? Like, there's no one on their team. I know, they got but the one good line. Yeah, but they're doing great, right? And, you know, the Oilers are the same way. Like, the Oilers have this amazing team and this amazing lineup that's working. And, you know, so, I don't know. It's always just a crapshoot who wins any chunk in the, in the Stanley Cup of what team's playing really good. Well, let's root for a Rangers Oilers Stanley Cup, huh? I, I could go for that. That'd be fun. I'll through for that. That'd be fun. But uh, yeah, Harry, thanks so much for jumping on, joining us, and uh, maybe we'll get you back on in the future again. Yeah, that'd be awesome, dude. Thank you so much to Harry for joining us this week. Uh, what an awesome guy with awesome stories. I mean, when he only played four years in the NHL, unfortunately, as he said, his career got uh, cut short there by a head injury. But, I mean, what legendary players to play with, legendary coaches to play for. Um, what a, It was a great interview. I really enjoyed that. What a nice guy. And uh, that does it for episode 126 of the Broadway Hat Podcast. Make sure you go and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review. Every five-star review, we do receive a dollar. It's only Alex's Lemonade Foundation. So, please, make sure you go on there, leave us a five-star review, and help an amazing cause fight pediatric cancer. Please go and subscribe to the show on Spotify as well. Leave us a five-star review there. You can find the show on Google Play, Pandora, Spreaker, anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us there. Make sure you also follow the show on social media as well, on Facebook and Instagram at the Broadway Hat Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Broadway Hat Pod, at the Broadway at Broadway Hat Pod, sorry. You can find us by personal Twitter account at KHallNY for all new Granger news. Also, make sure you subscribe to the show on YouTube. Uh, we, we, li- we have uh, clips of the show. We have full episodes. And great content there on our YouTube channel. So make sure you go and subscribe there. And thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next week.